Hello, and welcome to today's Ask the Experts webinar, Algorithms 101, Youth and AI-Driven Tech. I am Chris Perry, Executive Director of Children's Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. Algorithms are all around us in the digital world. The next video or post as you scroll social media, shows and movies flagged for you on streaming platforms, search results on Google, the ads you see in your favorite game show or platform, and maybe even the next worksheet, resource, or learning intervention recommended for a student. Though not always obvious, algorithms are often driving the landscape of what and who we interact with online every day, and children are no exception. For today's webinar, we've brought together an interdisciplinary panel with expertise in computer science, human computer learning, communications, and youth mental health to discuss how youth interact with algorithms and what risks and opportunities those experiences may present for development, safety, and well-being. They will also discuss the impact of encoded bias and the role of algorithmic literacy for youth and caregivers alike. To get us started, I am pleased to introduce you to today's moderator, Imran Ahmed. Imran is the founder and CEO of the Center for Countering Digital Hate, US-UK. He is an authority on social and psychological malignancies on social media, such as identity-based hate, extremism, disinformation, and conspiracy theories. He regularly appears in the media and in documentaries as an expert in how bad actors use digital spaces to harm others and benefit themselves as well as how and why bad platforms allow them to do so. Imram also advises politicians around the world on policy and legislation. Welcome, Imran. Thanks so much, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Imran Ahmed. Um, I'm chief executive and I'm founder of the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Um, I, I set up CCDH seven years ago when um, working in British politics, I'm British, uh, if the accent hadn't given it away, um, and seeing simultaneously the rise of a virulent anti-Semitism on the left of our political movement, but also working on the EU referendum, seeing the rise of conspiracism and hate uh, towards black people and Muslims in the UK, and then the assassination of my colleague, Joe Cox, who was a 35-year-old mother of two, um, a member of parliament for Batley and Spen by a far-right um, terrorist who'd been radicalized online in part. And what I wanted to understand was, why was it that bad actors were so good at using these spaces online? I spent three years studying the way that bad actors operate, the way that they drip, drip disinformation to try and color the lens through which people see the world uh, and then activate them in moments of crisis. Um, but we, what we realized over time was that the platforms were integral to why this was, why the problem was occurring. And in particular, you know, that, that magical word that, that all of us talk about, but many of us don't really know how to easily define an algorithm. And it's, so what is an algorithm? I mean, at its core, it is fundamentally just a mathematical formula. It's just a way of, of, of ordering things, uh, in particular on social media, the way of ordering the information that's on there. If you think about what a social media company is, it's basically a business that takes in lots of speech from lots of different people and data points and you know who you are, your cell phone number, et cetera, what you look at, what you're interested in. And then it just orders that speech in a way that creates a timeline. And the timeline is the product. The product isn't you being able to post. The product is the timeline. And why do I know that's the product? Because that's where the ads are. And 98% of the revenues of a company like Meta come from the ads. The ads that are specific to your interests quite often, but also you know, put onto a timeline that's designed to keep you scrolling. Why do they want to keep you scrolling? Because you consume more ads. 
And how do they keep you scrolling? Well, they do that through a series of psychological mechanisms that keep you addicted, that put you in a state where you need to see what's next. And quite often, sadly, disinformation, hate are actually more interesting for people. Um, content that's harmful is more interesting because it's it's like it is the forbidden fruit. It's what we what we what we want to argue over, what we want to talk about, what we want to the, the the things that trigger us psychologically individually. The misconception about social media platforms is that they just give you what you want to see. They don't. They give you what they want you to see based on your unique psychology. What keeps you addicted based on your unique psychology? Let me give you an example of how this works in practice. A couple of years ago, I had the great honor of meeting uh, a man called Ian Russell. Ian's 14 year old daughter, Molly, was 14 years old when she took her life um, in England. And Ian, being a man of um, great integrity and resolve, decided that he wanted to find out why, and he wouldn't leave any stone unturned. Now, one of the things that he realized was that her social media consumption was worrying. And so he persuaded a coroner in the UK to actually force Meta and Pinterest to hand over the data that she'd been consuming. And what they realized was that the platforms had so systematically overwhelmed her with content that told her that it was normal that if you hurt inside, you hurt yourself outside. And if you really hurt inside, you kill yourself. That it was understandable that she had concluded that this was normal. They'd normalized the idea of self-harm through frequency with which the content was delivered to her. We did a study a couple of, no, a year ago called Deadly by Design, in which we studied setting up accounts as 13 year old girls in TikTok in four different countries at CCDH. And then we recorded what content they served up. A brand new account, no information beyond that, it's a 13 year old girl. Within 2.6 minutes, suicide content. Within eight minutes, eating disorder content. Every 39 seconds on average. And here's what was really pernicious. We named half the accounts with a, a normal girl's name, like Susan. We named the other half with a name like Susan Lose Weight to give it an indication that there was something psychologically there. Those vulnerable accounts got 12 times the malignant content of the other accounts. So the platform recognizes vulnerability. The algorithms are sophisticated enough based on so much data that they've captured from billions of interactions, that they know that those people will be triggered and will be addicted to that kind of content. We did a report recently on steroid-like drugs, looking at how young men are being told, on again on TikTok, that they're not good enough the way that they are, that the, you know, the real measure of a man is not being kind and you know financially responsible, which is, probably the only two reasons my wife might married me, but being strong, physically powerful, massive muscles, Captain America physique. And they were being told that the only way to do that is through steroids. By the way, they were linking to their web stores where you could buy those illegal steroids and then telling them that when they come home, when, they, when they're delivered to your home, just tell your parents they're vitamins. Now, about a year ago, no, about a year ago, we started talking with the Entertainment Industry Foundation in Hollywood um, about a PSA, which is running across the US right now. I want to play it for you very quickly. Um, you might recognize the voice. It's Laura Linney, the um, the uh, actress, the Emmy and Globe, Golden Globe winning actress, I, I am told. But I don't know quite what that means. Um, I, uh, here we go. I'm just going to play it for you now. Within 15 seconds of logging onto social media, the algorithm has your daughter in its crosshairs. It sends her a steady flow of images telling her she isn't thin enough. 
pretty enough. They invade her brain, causing body dysmorphia, anxiety, depression, leading to the worst rates of eating disorders, self-harm, and suicide we have ever known. All while she's sitting right next to you on her phone. Congress knows, but it refuses to act. Don't let her suffer the secret pain alone. Use your voice. Demand a plan. Join us at the Center for Countering Digital Hate. ProtectingKidsOnline.org because it's up to you to protect your children from social media nightmares. Join us for her, for your daughter. That PSA's um, played around the country for a few months now. Um, I am told it's had uh, close to a billion views um, and has been played, you know, tens of thousands of times across the US. Um, and it is, important that we are talking about these algorithms because two-thirds of our American te of American teens and my children will be American too uh, use TikTok. Um, one in six say they watch it almost constantly. On average they spend more than 90 minutes a day there and what I'm scared about what my wife Liz and I talk about all the time is well what will we do what could we do that could counteract 90 minutes of programming a day by an algorithm that is purely commercially motivated. You know, our worry is that we did some surveys on conspiracy theories recently. 49% of adults agreed with, you know, four or more conspiracy theories that we asked them about. But 60% of 13 to 17 year olds, 34% of adults thought that Jews control the world. 43% of 14 to 17 year olds, 59% of 14 to 17 year olds use social media for four plus hours a day. Those are really disturbing numbers. That is, those are the sorts of numbers that in Europe, we know what happens if the vast majority of people think that Jews are a danger to our society. It leads to terror beyond imagination. And I, my worry is about the future of our society, our children, and our democracy. We know through other studies that when people watch one conspiracy video, they're shown other types. So we did a study called Malgorithm. If you watch stuff about COVID or anti-vax conspiracies, it starts feeding you anti-Semitic and QAnon conspiracies on Instagram. And we know that parents worry about this. 68% of adults and 83% of children acknowledge that online harms, online harms have a real world impact. 74% want platforms to build pl uh, products according to safety by design. We need legislation, we need change. And that's what we're here to talk about a little bit about today, to find out more about, you know, what are some of the solutions that are out there? And to give us, you know, I will be listening just as intently as everyone else, because this is something that's relevant to my life too. And I feel as powerless as anyone else does when faced with the notion of a child who wants to be on social media, but we know how harmful it can be. So I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing our first speaker, Dr. Elvira Perez Vallejos. Please correct me if I was wrong on that is a professor of mental health and technology at the University of Nottingham, where her multidisciplinary work crosses boundaries between the School of Computer Science and the School of Medicine. Currently, she's the Director of Responsible Research and Innovation at the, school, uh, at the UKRI, Responsible AI UK Ecosystem, as well as RRI Lead at the UKRI Trustworthy Autonomous Systems Hub. She's the youth leader at the MRC Digital Youth Programme, and she specialises in assessing the impact that technology has on the mental well-being of groups with protected characteristics. So children, young people, older adults, applying co-design and participatory methods, e.g. youth juries. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Elvira to you all. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I'll, um, I'll share my screen and I will present um, some work we did a few years ago with um, children and young people. So as you correctly said, um, algorithms are a piece of code that intentionally, well, are designed to make, let's say the internet more efficient, to personalize searches. When we look at social media, uh, what we do is, or what we intend is to present, for example, feeds that are more in line with with your preferences, with who you are. So some people may don't may, may not know that if you do a search in Google and you are logged in, 
um, the results will be different for you than for me because Google over time creates an image, creates a persona, a profile of who you are, and then it will, the algorithm will personalize the results. So what we did um, a couple of years ago was to ask young people about um, their awareness of what, what they think an algorithm is. And also we asked them to reflect on the impact that algorithms may have on their, on their well-being and in, on their lives. So what I will be presenting uh, today is based on two specific pieces of work and I will provide the links. The first one is a paper that looks at the impact of algorithmic decision-making processes on young people's well-being. And the second one is a report that looks at the impact of screen time on education and well-being, again, in children and young people. So in the first study, what we did was engage with around 200 young people, and we created these youth juries where we present scenarios that previously have been co-produced with, with young people. And we asked them to discuss, to tell us what they thought. So when we presented uh, examples, so for example, uh, TikTok. TikTok is able to personalize some of the, the content or YouTube, so the videos you, you watch. Um, so they said that actually there are lots of benefits um, it's convenient. Sometimes it's just easier to do a search in Google than actually do any other more complicated piece of research to find out a specific answer. So it's easy, it's convenient, it's there. It's also very entertaining. Um, it takes away your mind if you had a bad day. And also it's good that it has a personalized content. So it's important and relevant for you as a user. So there are some benefits. But unfortunately, there are lots of harms. So the main issue is around privacy. So young people are concerned about how algorithms are able to collect so much data about a person. They are worried about over engagement. So for example, TikTok is a perfect example. TikTok has been designed to capture your attention. And it is not fair to put the responsibility in the children and young people to be able to disengage. And I will talk about responsibility in a second. The design is over-engaging and that's something that is almost impossible to escape. So there is an issue with that design. It's unethical to create these interfaces, this design for children and young people. There's also issues around trust. So for example, when you are constantly interacting with a system that you don't trust 100%, that again causes a sense of, sense of being uncomfortable. And again, that in, affects your well-being. Unfortunately, there is lots of harmful content that you describe. And another main issue is that while you are looking at your phone, you are not moving, you are inactive, just sedentary. And again, as a child, children should be running around, should be very active. So it has a very important consequence for, for their physical health and obviously for their mental health. So how can I move my presentation to the next slide? Yeah, perfect. So when, overall, when we think are algorithms good or bad, what we know, and there is lots of evidence, is that there is a massive impact on the developmental milestones of children. So cognitively, children are, are and unfortunately, and we do all that, we parents, we will give a child a phone, a tablet, when they're still very young, because it's convenient, and they will entertain themselves. COVID had a massive impact, so children learn to be in front of a screen hours and hours. So it has a massive impact on the way children socialize, on the way children uh, develop language, writing skills. It also, as I just said, is, it has a massive impact on the, the physical health because they are very inactive. 
but also impact on relationships and emotions. Relationships are extremely complicated. It's you constantly have to constantly negotiate. And children nowadays are interacting less face-to-face -face with other children. They do that in school, but they are spending, again, too much time on, a, on in front of their screens. So whose responsibility it is? It is completely unfair to put all that responsibility on the parents, but also it's very not a good idea to put also that responsibility on the children. So whose responsibility it is? Obviously, parents have to have the skills, the digital literacy to understand, to put time limits, but it's not fair to design this technology that is over-engaging, give it to parents, give it to children, and then expect that they are going to be able to self-regulate themselves. Is it the responsibility of the platforms, of the companies that are designing these uh, services that are creating these algorithms? The answer is yes. And there are lots of interesting pieces of regulation that are trying to basically legislate and make these practices unethical. And what I'm hoping is that maybe in 10 years, we look back and there will be lots of changes and we will be surprised of the current situation right now because it's, it's been very, very harmful to children and young people. So what can we do in the meantime? So we need to lobby uh, politicians. We need to ensure that there are policy interventions that really address both the benefits, but also the harms. We need policy, we need technical regulatory, and also very strong and well-defined education strategies. And we need that urgently. In the, in the UK, we have the online safety bill that actually is designed to protect uh, children, young people of harms. Unfortunately, companies are so powerful that this safety bill actually is not having the effect that it was uh, designed for. So when we ask young people, what, what should we do? Young people are telling us governments, they, they have lots of responsibility, lots, of to, lots and lots of work to do to create digital products that are that comply with the needs of the user. We need more transparency on the data all these companies are gathering from children and young people simply by accessing their services. There is a completely um, power imbalance and the user should be the owner of that data and should have more control of how that data is being used and misused to create algorithms that are more and more engaging. And also there is a duty of care. Government should be protected, children and young people should be ensured that their well-being is a priority. So there are also recommendations for tech companies. And these, again, are recommendations that are coming from children and young people that are uh, from 14 to 17 years old. What they would like to see is that companies are being incentivized to create more positive content and to remove harmful content. They want to see opportunities in the design for to ensure that the well, well-being is central. For example, adding a button that says, I'm distressed about this content. So they can be, can be removed very fast. They want to see more transparency about harms. They want to understand the impact of a specific content. Why is that bad? Sometimes they don't understand the, the short and medium and long-term impact that it can have on their well-being. And again, age appropriateness is such a crucial. So many children and young people say, we would love to have an internet. We would love to have social media that is kind to children and they feel protected and they feel safe. There is also recommendations for education. So for example, there is important, um, lots, of, again, lots of work to do on bringing more evidence and bring, bringing more research to build coping strategies for children, for them to be able to disengage and have more control. And also we have to improve the training and the education they receive around um, data literacy, AI, AI literacy, etc. So this is um, 
the end of my talk, but I also I wanted to to mention that when we look at screen screen time, it's not necessarily a good uh, index. Children nowadays uh, have to interact with social media, with the internet, and they can be creative. They can socialize. There are lots of benefits. We cannot take away. Unfortunately, this is the way it is. So what we need to ensure is that when they engage, they do it creatively, they do it safely, and they feel controlled and they feel safe. And it's an experience that is going to support the, their well-being and mental health. So algorithms are not going anywhere. So the hope is to regulate them and to ensure that they are kind and and supportive. And it's, it feel, it's, it's kind of sad that we are in this, but, but I think I want to bring hope and hopefully there will be regulation and legislation that hopefully in five, 10 years, everything hopefully will be different, but thank you. Thank you so much. That was re really helpful. And thank you for the, the, the note of hope at the end. I, I share your hope. Technology is a wonderful thing. Um, you know, life is much more interesting being able to access all this information, being able to communicate with people. I moved to the US in the middle of the pandemic. How else did I, you know, receive love, friendship, sucker, um, be able to see what my what the people I care about are doing through social media. And so it's it's so sad that there are these really negative aspects to them. Let's let's just talk about the, the, the positive aspect. Everyone talks about ban the algorithms. And you know, anyone <laughs> anyone that spends time in these working on technology knows that you can't actually ban algorithms. They are a fundamental part of how you operate a, a, a computer system. What's the good side to algorithms? Why do we use them in the first place? So algorithms are essential. The amount of data that is out there is, is massive. So without algorithms, we will never be able to um, select, filter, and customize um, searches or preferences, your news feeds. And if you like cooking, you like to receive uh, more information about cooking or beauty. The important thing is that if um, if the structures and the systems that are governing those algorithms, if they are built responsibly, then we can trust the algorithms. Algorithms are neutral, are simply tools. These, actually, they are not good or bad, it's how they are being used and the data that is being that fits those algorithms, but also the intentions, the commercial intentions behind. So my, my hope comes from initiatives that promote responsible innovation, responsible research, uh, EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion. So more democratic ways and more transparent ways to build um, algorithms. So, so hopefully soon um, companies will have to have very strict regulations and ensure that algorithms are safe and 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 yeah the, the benefits are are massive we entertainment information uh, sharing is is a very it can be it can be an extremely creative uh, part of our lives and many people many young people use them um, without any issues so we cannot neither forget that group that actually benefits and use um, they create amazing music and videos and share and connect with other other people. So the yeah, algorithms are necessarily, they are not good or bad. It's just, unfortunately, the way many companies use them to engage children to a point where it's unfortunately unhealthy. Uh, thank you. And I, I think you, re you, know, you really make the point there about the, the, the algorithms are a necessary part of modern life in particular in big data systems and that's you know that's that's what our internet is 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 based on however what we don't understand is how those commercial imperatives of these large corporations that own the algorithms that underpin the most popular platforms in the world how they're constructed what the logic is inside them what the what they are oriented to deliver 
And it's transparency that's really necessary. We, you know, the European Union has the Digital Services Act now, which institutes, and they've got their new uh, transparency. Um, they've got their algorithm study center in, I think it's in Seville, in Spain. Um, and the UK Online Safety Act, uh, which became law a couple of, a few weeks ago, you know, that may change things as well. But the US, we have nothing. We have an absolute black box for American parents where they're not being protected because legislators have not even done the basic thing, forced a bit of transparency on these algorithms that are so important in our day to day lives. And that's why I'm so excited about introducing our next speaker. We've got Dr. Motahari Islami, who's an assistant professor at the School of Computer Science. Human Computer Interaction Institute, the HCII, and Software and Societal Systems Department, S3D, at Carnegie Mellon University. And Motahari's research goal is to investigate the existing accountability challenges in algorithmic systems and to empower the users of algorithmic systems, particularly those who belong to marginalized communities and those whose decisions impact marginalized communities, make transparent, fair and informed decisions in interaction with algorithmic systems. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Imran, for the introduction. Um, I appreciate that. So um, I'm going to talk about, as Imran mentioned, about how we can empower users, particularly youth, as a large um, group of um, algorithmic system users to be able to deal with, um, navigate, and cha challenge this algorithmic bias existing. Um, in their everyday use. And I'm going to start with this example. This looks old. It's more than 10 years ago when Google search um, would show you that if you search for black girls, it would show you inappropriate search results, sometimes like, um, you know, like um, sexual content, which was not the case for white girls or other um, races. And the same thing for uh, you know, if you search for three black teenagers, it would show you mock shots. While three teenagers or three white teenagers, it would show you some friendly, lovely pictures. And you might think, oh, we are past that time. Now these systems are improved. They are, you know, the more level of these racial, sexual, or misogynist like biases are removed. It's not the case. So. This is the case of the whistleblower um, at Facebook a couple of years ago about how um, um, these social media platforms, particularly the way that the algorithms work, impact, um, have negative impacts on girls, similar to what we saw at the beginning of the panel. And I want to talk more about what happens that these harms uh, take effect as because we just talked about, you know, algorithms are not bad at good. They are just a way ways of to make things more efficient, powerful. They connect us to the world. So I'm I'm a computer scientist, so I love working with algorithms and code and programs. But we want to see what happens. And one of the reasons these things happen is that the algorithms just learn from us, from the world that we are in, and just amplify things. So if you have one biased person that you might encounter in the street and just get past them and over now algorithms can exacerbate the bias of many um, biased people, have, have like the racist people, the sexist people, and show it in the platforms like social media, which we don't know, like which the youth might know, not know that these, these algorithms are not necessarily talking about truth. It's not about what the world should look like. It's just exacerbating what the bias world we have here. Another example is actually how this can even affect kids in high stake domains, for example, this is a study um, showed that, you know, racism and gender injustice, they are just embedded in algorithmic driven technologies, such as there are some child um, um, or family screening tools in cities that they try to predict or try to understand how high risk is a, ch uh, is a family to a child if there is child abuse. And research has shown that these algorithms are um, racially biased they would accuse more black families of child abuse while it's not the case actually so what does it mean i mean we talked about who is responsible we talk about all these corporations these systems the developers the domain experts dealing with these algorithmic systems but we are talking also about the youth the people who are encountering with these systems every day it's because it has become a part of their life and 
as much as I love and I'm being an ideal world that you know we have responsible organizations and like like a lot of research and work going into the systems before they are released to make sure we are protecting our uh, youth. It's not the case. So we are already in this world. So how we can prepare our youth in navigating of a before a bias world, but now an algorithmic bias world. So. I'm going to talk about youth as a stakeholders, actually, in these algorithmic driven words and how they deal with bias. So just when the pandemic hit uh, about three years ago, the UK government, and you, many of you might have known that, started uh, to get the challenge of um, teachers, like staff or a staff shortage. So they couldn't get the grades on time for the kids, particularly the youth in the high school that they wanted to get to college and they needed their grades. So the UK um, educational department decided to use an algorithmic driven system to predict the grades of the people, like based on their performance up to that you know, time before the pandemic. Um, and I don't think they had bad or malicious intentions. They were like, okay, let's just use a system to make things go on. We don't want to get these kids stopped from getting applied, applying to like colleges and stuff like that. But the problem that no one thought about that is that, but you know, like how this algorithm is going to predict that. The results show that uh, the kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or from vulnerable backgrounds actually got lower grades by all, this, by all the systems. And what was interesting here that kids took this into their own hands. So they started a protest outside this Department of Just, uh, Department of Education for many days. They talked about the challenges of these algorithms. They said, these algorithms are not knowing me, they are doing wrong. And the part that they love, even this was an inf unfortunate incident, was that the UK government had to dish their exam results and go back to find human uh, evaluations for these kids. It doesn't mean that everything has been reverted. Like some of these kids already got college rejections. There were definitely this algorithm imprint stayed there. But these kids did something that maybe like we adults didn't know. They realized that, oh, this algorithm is not really uh, distributing the grades fairly. Like I'm seeing that I did pretty like, like my classmate, but I'm getting lower um, grades. So what it shows is that can we have youth as a stakeholders to actually learn to deal with these biases? You know, you you talk to your kids about biases in society sooner or later. We talk about, hey, there are racist people out there. There are sexist people out there. How we can help them to know that these algorithmic systems can be as biased or even more as humans and do not look at them as an objective system. So we ran a study actually with um, some of my colleagues who's Amy Ogan is gonna continue talking about this in the next um, part. Um, and the goal was to understand, can really kids or youth know about these biases? So what we did was we showed them some results of algorithmic um, curated content and we asked them if they are fair. And we intentionally had some nuanced biases. For example, this is a search if you search for wedding. And if you look at this, this is particularly Western. This is all heterosexual couples. They are, there's not much interracial, you know, marriage here. And the kids really noticed those. So they were really good. They were like only young people, white marrying white, black marrying white. There's no gay and lesbian. So they are really better than maybe we think they are. And then we also talked about what does fair AI or algorithmic system means. For example, this is the search for a computer programmer. They talked about, oh, there are more men in the computer programming. Does it mean that the algorithmic search results should show that or it should inspire a real, uh, an ideal world? So they are knowing about these nuanced com contemplations. So what we are doing right now is actually building a tool called We Audit, which is its goal is to engage everyday users like us here and including youth to learn about biases in these systems to learn that these algorithms can be as harmful as some um, mistakes people make and also be help them to find these issues try to become a part of this um, larger advocacy 
to bring awareness and action against algorithmic bias. And I want to end with this a note about what to do as parents, education professionals, some of us here are researchers or we can have multiple roles here, is that how we can empower youth advocacy and action around this inequity in algorithmic systems. Again, we have other stakeholders, they have a lot of role to play, but we need also to prepare our youth. And I think we all need to know AI is the new math. This algorithmic systems needs to be learned, but now this with flaws. If two plus two always is four, that's not the case algorithmic systems work. So the AI literacy is the first stage. And uh, my colleague, Amy Ogan, is gonna talk about how to bring AI literacy to the kids and the parents and families to inform you to be a better users of algorithmic system. And with that, I'm gonna, I'd be happy to take questions. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, you, 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 the thing that really came to mind is that we're doing some work at the moment on AI and how generative AI systems, which are those AI systems that create new content from nothing, from a, from a simple prompt, how they encode um, the biases of the content that's fed into them. And, you know, unfortunately, an AI system is only as smart as the content is given, really. If the content is given is nonsense. And, you know, some of these AI platforms are literally just taking everything that's written on the Internet, you know, including a lot of absolutely bonkers stuff. Um, but what are your concerns about AI and how that might hard code some of these algorithmic biases further in our society? That's a really good question. And I, I know that also the next series about going to be about this, about generative AI. And I encourage the audience to watch that because I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I think it's going to be very informative because the kids are now also users of, you know, generative AI or chat GBT. And we actually also uh, have run recently a study that we found that these kids really trust this type of generative AI. You know, they think that it's going to give you right answers. It does not. I don't know if you know, but generative AI or chat GPT can't do multiplication or simple math even problem because that's not how it's built. And still people trust it. What is happening though is that the difference between what we talked so far about is what I call curative AI. It means that it gives you give some information to that. It's going to, you know, rehash it, choose it and show it to you. But generative AI is now a new word because the potential is limitless. You know, you can have, you can just generate indefinitely. And then the problem is that in that generation of content, no one, I'm going to emphasize no one, even those companies building that have controlled what it's going to generate. And that's the problem that we as youth, we need to help them to understand that these biases that we had so far, that it was like, reflecting the society, it can actually go to another level. I still don't know. I mean, so far we were like, oh, these are the existing biases we see in the systems. I even expect, unfortunately, in five years, we see new biases coming out that we even think didn't think about that. So that's, I think, that, that how AI is getting to get more like, like an opportunity, but at the same time, when the opportunity grows, the limitations and the challenges can happen too. Thank you. I mean, one of the things I always say is that if we hadn't called it artificial intelligence, people would realize that sometimes AI can be very stupid. It reminds me sometimes of, of, uh, of uh, you know, one of those young men who's been to a very good private school. He's very good at blagging, but actually knows nothing. So it's just a very confident idiot, which uh, is a term that has been also used to describe me at times. Um, yeah, that's a very good description. <laughs> but... Coming up next is not a confident idiot, it's a confident, clever person. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Amy Ogan, who's an associate professor, and thank you, Meshahari, that was wonderful. Um, of, uh, it's an associate professor of learning sciences at the Human Computer Interaction Inst uh, no, uh, Institute at Carnegie Mellon. She's an educational technologist with degrees in computer science and Spanish, and a PhD in human computer interaction, supported by an Institute of Education Sciences IES fellowship. She's received many awards and fellowships to study the use of educational technologies in emerging economies across many international sites. Delighted to introduce Amy Oden. Great. 
Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I'm very pleased to be talking after my colleague Motahari, uh, who has introduced all of the work that we've been doing together so well. Um, so I'm going to continue on from that discussion of algorithmic bias and how youth engage with it to talk about uh, ideas around algorithmic literacy. So um, as Elvira said, of course, uh, we would feel that it's the responsibility of companies to create more fair AI. Uh, however, as Motahari said, it's also important that we don't sit around and just wait for that to happen. So what are the things that we can do about it? Well, we can help young people develop AI literacy. Now, a few deca decades ago, we recognized that we had to develop new concepts of digital literacy to help children learn to use computer-based tools. Um, but AI literacy goes beyond that. And it in fact supports individuals agency, giving them the ability to make important informed decisions about what happens with that technology and how that AI uh, impacts their lives as well as to better advocate for their rights and participate in those critical conversations around AI that Motahari was talking about just a minute ago. So if it's such an important part of their current and future engagement with technology, why is it that young people as stakeholders are not really included in learning about and even shaping the future of responsible AI? Of course, there are many reasons for this, but there are three in particular that currently prevent schools and parents from engaging young people in developing AI literacy. And in our labs, we've been working very hard on thinking about these issues, uh, understanding those barriers and finding ways to overcome them. And so what I'll tell you about today is the work that we've been doing in particular with our PhD student, Jamery, Souls to uh, runs um, large workshops with children in many different settings uh, and with different uh, sets of demographics to look at how children engage with AI and what we might do to increase their AI literacy. So the first barrier that we often see is that people may believe that children do not have enough technical knowledge they don't know how to program, they may not understand the technical details of what an algorithm is and exactly how it works, and so maybe they aren't ready to engage in AI literacy. But through our work, we've seen that children uh, as young as 11 and even younger can easily identify bias in AI examples, and Motahari showed you some of those. And that was true even for youth with very low prior experience, um, so who may not have any had any programming, who have not really engaged with uh, technical devices, who didn't have phones, even those with low prior exposure to technology were sensitive to and articulate about bias in AI. In fact, many of our learners, even without uh, being prompted to, were able to differentiate between those who build technology, the coders or developers, and those who help design technology. And many of them stated that they specifically wanted to be in an empowered designer role, and they wanted to be the one who called the shots when creating futuristic AI technologies. And what we saw when we had them engage in design activities was that they were really amazing at bringing their own identities into the technology designs that they came up with. So here's just one quick example of two learners who created some AI powered robotics ideas and they designed their robots to have hairstyles like theirs, even though they had never seen an example like this anywhere in their real lives. Um, another, one of our learners uh, talked about AI that would encourage boys to be kinder. <laughs> she told us about her experiences of feeling discriminated against by boys in sports class. So they were able to take these ideas of, of uh, bias and, uh, and harm that they experienced in real life and bring it to the design of technologies uh, in these activities. 
The second barrier that we sometimes see with parents in schools is that kids don't quite yet have the ethical or moral reasoning uh, that they might need to have to recognize algorithmic uh, bias or unfairness. Um, and in fact, what we saw was that uh, learners were really easily able to quickly identify bias, harm, or unfairness and uh, express it as a feeling of equality. Things should be equal. Everyone should get treated the same. Uh, that's the idea of equality. Um, however, what we know is that uh, with discussion, with uh, prompts for great deeper thinking, they were able to transfer that to more complex ideas like thinking about equity rather than equality. So should everyone get exactly the same or maybe people who uh, need something different should get more or should get a different version. And they were also able to think about things like consent, unfair is collecting data without people without telling people. So a more nuanced idea of what it means to be fair or unbiased or unharmful. Our third barrier that we often see, and this one may come particularly from some sets of parents, uh, is that young people need protection from serious topics. And I'm not denying that this is true. We want our children to remain children. We want to keep them in a safe environment. But we, what we also know is that children have exposure to serious topics all of the time. And this happens in, in particular for some demographic groups of children earlier and more frequently than others. They are already confronted with these issues. And in fact, we did see that when we run our workshops and our activities with children, that they are in fact affected by this exposure to algorithmic bias. So it brings up strong emotions for them. So here's one example of, um, of, an, uh, of an AI prediction that we showed to children. So uh, we asked Google, why are Asian? And we, we left it blank in the search. And then it brought up a set of uh, autocomplete um, answers for why are Asians? And the top one is why are Asians so good at math? This is a question your child might definitely uh, enter into a search engine. They hear something, they ask Google about it. And the immediate reaction from our children was shock. This is too stereotypical, this is racist. Even at 11 years old, this is something that they're thinking about. Um, uh, and where we take the conversation from there is the idea of critical consciousness. It, this is an idea that stems from black feminism and it's the ability to recognize and critique systems of oppression, but also to take action against oppressive systems. And this is something that does not come automatically, but it can be cultivated through reflection and analysis. And so that's what we engage in with our AI literacy programs to help foster this critical consciousness in the context of AI, for things that children are already seeing in the world and thinking about. Um, so we found that girls who were engaged in our activities were able with, with support of facilitators to clearly express their ideas and articulate how it made them feel and why. They were able to show resilience and informed opinions supported by their emotions. So, if we have these three barriers that we know can be overcome, uh, what do we do about them? Well, Motahari in the last talk showed you one literacy AI literacy activity that uh, you might engage in as a parent or a school uh, with your child, and that is the idea of algorithm auditing. So I'm not gonna go too much into detail there, but we're really excited to have the version of We Audit come out that children can engage with. In the meantime, it's something that parents can walk through with their children. Uh, a simpler uh, activity that we have used in, with success in many of our research studies and workshops is to engage young children in uh, imagination activities. So here's a really simple one. Tell us a story about a fair artificial intelligence or an unfair artificial intelligence. 
What happened? Why was it fair? Why was it unfair? How did the person using the technology feel or how did they react? This is really easy activity for young children to engage in. Um, here's one that goes a little bit deeper, asking them to look at actual examples of artificial intelligence. So very simply, just look at this example of artificial intelligence. Did you notice anything about it? Is there anything unfair about it? And we do this in our workshops with, we show them about eight different examples. Uh, and in fact, uh, Motahare showed you some of those, the idea of weddings, uh, food, um, you know, a rich doctor walking on a street, what does that look like? And that's from a generative AI example. Um, and then a final activity that we often run is to actually ask young children to design their own technology. That is something that they would like to, um, to have in the world, something that would make their world better. And so we ask them to just draw it out, to make, to craft with some materials, uh, to build out an AI technology that they think would help the world. And uh, here is a, a little, just very simple workbook that we have for, for uh, girls to do uh, this activity with. So may, my AI technology idea is called and what it does. And then we ask them first to list the beneficial things it might do. But the, the important part of this activity is ask them, asking them to think about the risks or the harms that they might actually introduce by having this AI uh, built into their technology. And this one is a real challenge for them because oftentimes children think if I've built something, then it must be good. Or if a developer with good intentions builds something, then it must be good. So this is, this is the tricky bit where uh, the conversation with parents, with with peers, with teachers becomes important to talk about how intentions are not necessarily the same thing as outcomes. But all of these are ways that we can, uh, in very simple terms, without needing any technical background or understanding exactly how AI and algorithms work, engage young people in collaborative learning and engagement. We also find that the parental endorsement is really key uh, so as we said, many parents have concerns about showing uh, their children serious topics. And so engagement with parents, and that's something our next speaker will talk about, is really essential. Uh, and our third facet of this is connecting to their own lived experiences, like in my final workshop uh, activity that I showed about how they could actually build an AI that would help in their community. Uh, so these are some really great ways that we think we can help uh, prepare young people for a future in which algorithms are all over the place and ideally where they're helping us um, live better lives. Uh, and we've got lots of awesome people who have helped us with this work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really, really fascinating. Look, I mean, we, you know, what's really interesting to me is that there's some really creative solutions on how young people can be involved in there's some really creative solutions and also some advice for parents and how they can take part in it as well. You know, part of my job is making sure that our legislators are have the backs of parents and of young people. But here's a question for you. What roles, what sort of educational interventions, so systemic educational interventions, would you recommend to support youth agency and children's rights online? Yes, yeah, so um, we believe very strongly that as more and more schools are introducing computer science or programming as a core concept uh, that children and young people need to know in order to live in a world in which technology is everywhere, that AI literacy has to be a core component of that. So it is not enough to learn to program. Many people will go on and actually never be a programmer, but every child should know about AI literacy. And the brilliant thing is, well, in order to introduce a programming component into your school, you often need a specialist, somebody who's trained in computer science and in how to teach it. 
The types of activities that we showed just here are really easy. We've trained lots of facilitators to engage in them who have no technical background whatsoever. So I would advocate for AI literacy being a component absolutely of any digital literacy, programming, computer science uh, activities that children are doing in schools. That, look, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, we've got one more presenter today, so I'm delighted to move on to uh, Professor Ranjana Das. She's a professor in media and communications in the Department of Sociology at the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom. Professor Das researches users. She started a career off uh, researching audiences and users, and her current research interests span technology use, user-centric research on, algor on algorithms, datification and broader digital technologies. Very often she dovetails these interests with her interest in families, parenting and parenthood. And she's currently completing her fifth research book, Parents Talking Algorithms, due out in 2024 with Bristol University Press. And between 2023 and 2025, she's leading a Leverhulme Research Grant and a British Academy Grant, both on various aspects of parents, parenting and technology use. It couldn't be anyone better to speak to us now. So thanks, Ranjana. Thank you very much for having me today. And it was fascinating to listen to the previous speakers. And there's so many dovetails. I'll um, get right into it. So I'm going to talk about four dimensions of parents' algorithm literacies uh, from a project that I have been doing over the course of 2023, where I've been listening to parents up and down England, parents of kids aged between two weeks to 18 years old. Um, really listening to the various markers and dimensions of um, their uh, literacies with algorithms. Um, and um, I'm going to put a QR code on the screen there now, but there's a link in the chat to the paper that this draws from, because I'm going to completely not talk about the research literature on the background today and just my findings. If you want to uh, dig into those um, references, um, uh, th that paper is the one to check out. So I'm going to begin with a really powerful quote about something called the additional comments box that I heard from a mom called Nandini, a mom of Indian origin uh, with a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. And this mom was speaking to me about um, algorithms in the public domain and was speaking to me about her kids' futures. And Nandini was telling me, surely there's going to be an additional comments box, right? I mean, if there's an algorithm determining grades or something in my kids' futures, it can't, it can't, it, it can't just be based on uh, a man, an Oxford educated man, a middle class white man, putting some things as setting an algorithm up and not allowing for possible deviations. And that that became a metaphor for me, that additional comments box, because it seemed parents, moms and dads were asking for human intervention and not sometimes saying that it's human beings actually uh, behind tech and making those decisions. But there was this sort of strong call for that additional comments box with a real person. Um, and that really stayed with me throughout my fieldwork. So I'm going to talk today about uh, parents' algorithm literacies. And I wanted to just draw out that it's not really a new concept because, you know, we've had things like media literacy and digital literacies. Um, and I quite like to see algorithm literacies as part of that conversation of how we sort of understand, engage with, create with um, media and technologies. And I also wanted to really highlight it that it's really important that we don't place all the responsibility on individuals, uh, parents, carers, kids, communities to, you know, uh, uh, learn various things and resist uh, uh, big, powerful platforms who have and evade responsibilities. But I really uh, think that um, literacies in general are a really cool concept to keep in mind if we feel tempted to think that, you know, there's this big powerful media and completely powerless inactive audiences and users, which is totally not the case. So I think uh, literacies uh, do work really as an important idea. So I'm going to talk today about four dimensions of parents' algorithm literacies that I, that I saw and heard parents uh, demonstrate and talk about to me as we went along. First, their awareness of the presence of algorithms. And here we are talking about parenting, everyday, boring, mundane acts of parenting, online shopping, um, you know, watching other parents' kids get awards online and feeling bad about your own kid, just everyday acts of parenting and where algorithms come in. And also algorithms in your kids' lives, uh, your kids' lives on social media, algorithms in your kids' futures, so all of that. And the four dimensions I wanted to talk about was being aware that they're there, that algorithms are in the room with you. Two, parents' technical competencies with algorithms. Three, parents' critical capacities with algorithms. And fourth, 
their abilities to champion their best interests and their kids' best interests. And I'm going to talk about a, a few examples in each of these categories with some unreadable tables, but bear with me. First, I mention being aware that algorithms are there in the room with you, being aware of personalized search results, being aware that the feed that you see is curated for you and not chronological, being aware that the rankings of search results you see when you, I don't know, look for cots online or water bottles online are possibly different from person to person. Being aware that the news you see on that news aggregator is possibly different from somebody else's news aggregator. Uh, being aware of why certain recommendations keep coming up to you more to go and buy that outfit for World Book Day and noticing things like that. And I argue that, that just being aware that they're there uh, just might shape parents' abilities to sort of critically interpret and resist some of the pressures around parenting and some of the messages uh, around, you know, what you should be buying for your kids and doing for your kids, what your kids should be doing and so on. This relates also to your technical competencies. I saw many mums and dads doing things like leaving fewer data traces, not hitting like on something, not scrolling um, too slowly on something, deliberately searching Amazon for something to try to throw off the Amazon algorithm, really playful things that they weren't quite sort of presenting as sort of, yes, I'm trying to train the algorithm, but, but doing these little things here and there, clicking, not clicking, scrolling quickly, not scrolling quickly, almost trying to change the journey of their data. And I argue that these technical competencies are really important as well, because they shape the visibility and invisibility of, you know, your kids online on social media platforms. It shapes the journey of your data. Um, and these little things might seem little um, and might seem sort of really informal, but they amounted to something, uh, something big enough for me to say that, okay, this is a really key, key component of how parents interface with uh, algorithms. Third, really important again, parents' critical capacities with algorithms. So what are these? So some of the markers of this I found in my research with parents was sort of really understanding that if-then logic of algorithms, uh, that, that rule and that formula behind them, um, and understanding the commercial purposes of platforms' um, intentions. Uh, uh, when, when you know you're engaging with platforms, understanding that commercial purposes behind private organizations are different from, say, purposes behind public organizations. And then that sort of laying the foundation for being able to resist some of these pressures and resist some of these um, kinds of surveillance. Um, and, and, and you might say, well, that sort of links to those technical things they might do, right? Like not leaving too many data traces, trying to throw off the Amazon um, search algorithm or really critiquing, you know, what a news recommendation algorithm does. And absolutely, these aren't watertight dimensions, but uh, those critical capacities that scholars of media and digital literacy have always talked about apply here as well it's sort of really understanding aha that's that if making that then on my feed you know i've been searching about x or y or z and oh maybe that's why i keep seeing something and i had some really powerful conversations with a mom who like me is a mom of color and who possibly has to have that big talk at home with her you know kids of color just like i do um about you know growing up in england and um this mom keeps telling me uh, in our conversation that my youtube is full of uh, kids of color being attacked and um she's genuinely worried for a genuine reason but also you can see that recursivity that looping there of this mom's genuine anxiety and the many conversations at home and more and more videos and more and more and more videos so um these aspects of being aware of algorithms knowing how to sort of do little technical playful things with algorithms and also being critical about that if then logic they sort of coexist um, um, and go hand in hand to add up to that fourth and final dimension which is about you know champion your best interests champion your kids best interests and here I found so many examples of parents going and talking to the nursery that their kid goes to and saying hey this app that you've you know made mandatory and you've got rid of all the handwritten notes and all the handovers at the door and we now all have this fancy um, app Where's the data going? Hey, can I ask for my kid's face to be blurred out, please? Can you let me download my data? These sorts of many conversations that some parents were feeling able to have and some parents were not feeling able to have. Uh, some parents feeling like, well, what the school tells me about uh, technology seems really dated. Um, but I, I, what do I know? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know much. So that sort of feeling able to 
actually engage with institutions. And by institutions, I don't mean some big grand act. It's that moment of being able to go and talk to your kid's nursery. It's that moment of being able to go and talk to your, um, you know, kid's uh, teacher at school and engaging in conversation with institutions involving children. And they, these don't have to be, you know, um, technology related organizations, but they do employ technology. Um, and this, I found, opened up possibilities for parents to engage with the myriad institutions involved in childhood and care. And those many little conversations, that little message, that little email, um, asking for more clarity, asking for a leaflet to be edited, just thinking of examples here from these conversations, um, asking for more details about that app, they really matter. So I'm going to end there. The paper is uh, in the chat. And if you have any questions, um, please ask. Thank you so much, uh, Ranjana. That was that was fascinating. Um, I, I I wanted to ask, um, you, you know, one of the things you were talking about was retraining algorithms and these really opaque algorithms and people really are feeling in the dark. Um, one of the things when when we did when we put together that um, PSA that I talked about earlier on, you know, the reason for the PSA was a, a friend of mine who's a mom said to me that in, when she was young there was a PSA which said it's it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your kids are? And now she knows where her kids are. Her kids are next to her, but she doesn't know who's with her kids because they're on their cell phone. She doesn't know who's. What, what algorithms are shaping her kids' lives and how to communicate with them about it. How can parents explain to their kids, young kids, what an algorithm is and when they're interacting with what? I and mean, what are the ways in which you could do that? Um, so I found uh, these answers uh happened around mealtimes sometimes, sometimes in the car. One of the parents I spoke to told me, well, if they're in a car with me, then I'm not going anywhere else and she's not going anywhere else. And we've got to have those conversations there. So I think uh, there's something there about not making a huge big deal out of it and not making a big event out of it, but really using those everyday moments to have these sort of dinner table conversations that perhaps fall in a gap between what schools offer in terms of sort of, oh, let's teach you how to code. Um, but then these sorts of wider, more critical conversations possibly don't happen. And in my research, I found that the best conversations were actually had, you know, in between sort of on the school run, um, picking up a sibling from a dance class, waiting outside a swimming pool, um, because people have devices with them. And that moment of taking that moment to, to really talk to your kid about, oh, well, you see what why that particular Minecraft video is, is, is coming up on your feed, and why that particular YouTuber is coming up on your, your, your feed. I think those informal moments have real power in them. And I saw these parents, none of whom were tech experts at all by any stretch, using those moments by the pool, those moments in the car, those moments with a sandwich, trying to have those if and then conversations. And I think that was really powerful. Uh, that is fascinating. Thank you so much, Ranjana. Now, I think we're having a group discussion and Q&A now. So if, if all of our participants can come back, um, that'd be wonderful. Um, and we've got a few questions that have been sent in and uh, I'm just going to chuck them out. And if people want to answer first, then whoever gets first uh, wins. Um, so this question that's come in, what are the most effective strategies a parent can use to protect their child? Are there any specific softwares or products that can be used to block algorithms? So what are the most effective strategies a parent can use to protect their child? I can share my, not only professional, but as a parent, I have a two uh, teenage girls, 13 and 15. So I uh, have time limits. I have rules so they cannot go to the bedrooms in the night when it's time to go to sleep. And I there is some content moderation. So they will not be um, accessing content that is uh, not appropriate for their age. And some, some telephones, some mobile phones allow you to for that but i think the key is to 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 have um to be able to talk to your child to provide that safe space where you are not judgmental and you can ask them questions and if unfortunately they um present or they witness any upsetting so for example i asked them explicitly if they saw any content from the gaza israel conflict and they said yes so they were able to describe, I asked how they felt, and we had an important conversation around that topic. So I think the crucial point is for the child 
if the child witnessed something distressing to be able to talk to you and then is 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 by that, that conversation for the child also to understand that they can there are things they can do to 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 protect themselves because unfortunately there's harmful content there so talk to your child create a, a safety relationship where they can talk to you and then there are some practical limits you can incorporate Thank you. Does anyone else have any ideas? Any I mean, if I'm sorry, I've, um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add that I think that the thing that Elvira said about talking, it really is, it, it might sound sort of, you know, we always say that, but it really is sort of important to have that conversation channel going. And for me, it's not, I mean, I have an eight year old and a three year old. It's not specifically about any one technology. I think we have to bear in mind that this is an ongoing, unfolding work in progress conversation because they'll change, they'll get older, the world will change, the world will get more complex. And technology, of course, as we know, there'll be a new wave of new technology, right? But I think if you've got that relationship where you chat about these things openly, perhaps even share some research findings in, a, in an age appropriate way and um, perhaps gamify a few things. I remember last year we had a whole thing about, you know, let's play in the Internet detective where um, he would come and show me any pop ups and adverts that he got. And, you know, he got a home point for it with a little sticker on a chart. The different families have different methods. But I think it's that ongoing conversation. It's not a conversation that ends or is about one particular thing, but that an ongoing lifelong conversation where you grab those informal moments and have fun chats about technology. Really key. Thanks. Um, now that I've moved to America, um, and I've lived here for three and a half years, I, uh, I started doing therapy. And I've, I've learned the word vulnerability, which I didn't know as a British person. Um, uh, apparently, communication is important. And when we were writing, so I mean, earlier on I showed the PSA, we've got a website, protectingkidsonline.org. So that's protectingkidsonline.org. And there's a parent's guide there that Ian, the father of Molly Russell and I wrote about how do you create a bilateral, you know, a two-way conversation, a permanent two-way conversation based on vulnerability and honesty and openness and in which kids can tell, teach parents. It's so it's really symmetrical. T kids are teaching parents what they're seeing online, how these apps work as a user. And parents are helping them to contextualizing, contextualize their experiences there, contextualize some of the content there, understand that sometimes they're seeing things frequently that actually isn't normal. It isn't something that you would see frequently in the world around them. Um, and especially right now with everything that's happening with Israel-Palestine, I mean, you know, CCDH does a lot of extremism and counterterrorism work, and we spent the last five weeks looking at dead babies. Um, and it hasn't been very pleasant. And that can be very, very disturbing to a child. But that's you know, the kind of rabbit hole that kids can go down and it is very disturbing. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you know, we've talked a lot about parents and what kids can do. And we've talked a bit about what educational institutions and art can do as well. But how can parents advocate for more legislation or more effort by government to enforce ethical development and use of algorithms? Someone want to have a go? Can you repeat the last part? I lost the. So, just what can parents advocate? How can parents advocate for more legislation and more effort by governments to enforce ethical development and use of algorithms? So, what's missing that only government can do for us to help us with this this challenge of dealing with a world in which algorithms are everywhere? I think. Unfortunately, like, as I mentioned, like a lot of this is going to come from advocacy efforts or, you know, community driven efforts. Like uh, we here in the city of Pittsburgh in the United States, we had this case of a predictive policing system that was unfortunately actually was built in collaboration with some researchers, which I sure their intention was the best, you know, like try to find the areas that crime can happen. But it definitely affected black communities including youth you know we saw and there was like this concern about uh over policing and these predictive policing is like a sci-fi movies that you're going to predict who or which location they're going to like have crimes which is ethically have uh, is under question so what happened is that a lot of youth here like students 
among like along other community members who were worried about they had purchased and they brought it to the legislation level or like at least the concerns. And I don't think this is the right way necessarily because we don't want to put the people who are already vulnerable under more vulnerability and work and label to just defend their own rights. I think um still parents need to help kids to be more advocate of that. But I think in the legislation level it's more awareness. I think as more and more adults get more aware of these systems and their um, challenges, they can have a better say. But I, again, as I said, unfortunately, we are in this stage that we need more advocates to push this through. But it's, it's a massive challenge as a parent to influence law. Um, so some of the research we've done, we've used that evidence as, so there are sometimes parliamentarian inquiries and they ask for information for evidence and we present that, but as a parent, it's really difficult. I guess you need to talk to your, um, to the MPs, to, to representatives of your locality and, and, and talk to them about, but it's, it's very difficult because the, the, the asymmetries of power are massive. We had recently in the UK the AI summit, and and it was it was it, the, the, it was a very clear example of how powerful all these massive corporation Google Alphabet um, is. They are so powerful, and 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 innovation, innovation it seems to be a synonym of prosperity and economy. So how I think there is a fear of regulate too much, because the investment in AI. Is massive, so it's 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 an interest, it's a very interesting time. So, just one final question for the group. I mean, some of the most popular platforms do advertise user controls and tools to increase agency for for users. Do we know if young people are actually using these features and whether the tools actually change the experience in in a meaningful way? They do. They, they, for example, with Facebook, they are very savvy on their privacy um, settings. So my experience working with your children, the answer is yes, definitely. And uh, I mean, I, I know TikTok in response to our, the study that we did deadly by design allowed you to reset the algorithm. Now that, you know, speaks a little bit to what I think a, few, a couple of you have said about the ability to reprogram or, or to, to, to change the way the algorithm understands you. Is that something that you think parents should be doing on a regular basis, for example, with their kids, with their kids' accounts, resetting their algorithm so they, they're not being sucked into rabbit holes based on their previous experiences and, and interaction pa patterns? Um, I can comment on that more as the general way that people manipulate algorithms, maybe, is like, you know, particularly on social media or these feeds are curated by algorithmic filtering. I've seen people that intentionally um, confuse the algorithm or try to go broad, you know, like for example, to not get into echo chambers or rabbit holes, as you mentioned, or cause various theories by following people with different opinions, by um, like by trying to look at different content. Sometimes we had people that said, okay, sometimes I like something to tell that friend that I like that, but then I hide that later to tell the algorithm that I don't want to see more of this. So we definitely have ways to impact that. And I think it would be important to also teach kids about this, you know, like it's like a tool. It's like every other tool that you work with. If like you drive, you know, you teach how to drive a car and what to do when emergencies happen. So people definitely can do that. And I suggest that. It's hard to get you out of your echo chamber. It's hard to maybe follow the things that you don't necessarily agree. But if you see it's best for you to not get into conspiracy theories or for your child, I think that's the way people have done it. Well, look, thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna sort of come to an end soon, but I just wanted to give everyone a chance for a final thought. Um, you know, one 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 takeaway from today that you'd like to communicate to our audience out there. And we'll just go in order of, of, of the speakers from today. So starting with Elvira. So my, again, I want to close with a hopeful message. 
I think the awareness nowadays and the consequences, I think we are all part of a massive social experiment. And I have a feeling that all the all the new tech that appear in Silicon Valley, the motto was break things, just try, say sorry instead of not doing, just innovate, disrupt. That culture is changing because now we can see the harm that it has caused. Now we're in a second phase. We have generative AI. It feels that we're doing again the same. It has been deployed without assessing or evaluating the potential risks, for example, in education, in jobs. So we are again doing a second wave of a massive social experiment. My hope is that we are hopefully learning and there are really interesting frameworks for responsible innovation, responsible research. And I really hope we promote them within the research community, but also within the tech community, because I hope people feel, I hope people have a conscious and, and computer scientists, developers, they decide to change things and they have the power to change things. So I'm just hoping that just simply they, from the historical and the, the evidence we can see around us, that things are going to change because they, they have to change. Thank you. Masahara. Um, I want to follow up on what Vera said and say, um, I know it's challenging. I'm, I'm a parent and I know how it's hard dealing with all these screens and all this algorithmic content created. But one thing I think we need to learn is that, you know, any new technology that comes, our um, kids and youth are going to be audience of that. It's like, I uh, give the example of cars a lot, you know, when the cars came, oh, these teenagers can drive or what are the safety mechanisms we can put um, into effect. So I think this is the same, but the problem with this one is that it's very invisible. And that's the hard part. We need to learn about that. Like, you know, you can see if your kid hit a wall with a car and you can um, think about what to do next. Like, think about this invisibility and how it's harder and more complex. But as parents, as educational experts, as researchers, whoever is dealing in this domain, we are responsible to make these algorithmic systems safe as much as we can for our kids. Thank you. Amy. I'll just go back to how we started this uh, Q&A, that communication is so critical. And again, while we want governments and we want companies to be leading the charge on, on um, uh, revising and improving their algorithms, it's so important that parents, carers, and teachers feel comfortable, even though they don't have any technical knowledge, in just opening up a conversation, uh, asking your children, uh, you know, what are you doing? Uh, can you, t can we think about how these algorithms work? How do you think it works? How might we be, um, you know, impacted by these things? Doesn't take anything uh, professional level to have those sorts of open-ended conversations, but it might take time. And so leaving those channels of communication open and being willing to engage in those discussions to me is the most important thing. And that's, you know, I, I find that optimistic as well. That's going to uh, improve our society overall in the long run if we're able to do that. Thank you, Amy and Ranjana. Um, yeah, so two final thoughts, I think. The first one aligns with what colleagues have just said. Um, grab those moments that you have in your family, study your own family. I mean, if there are moments in the car, moments by the pool, moments um, on the school run where you think you can have those little chats, keep having those little chats because that relationship really matters and you don't need to be a tech expert for that. Um, uh, play little games, um, set down rules if you have to, but have that space. Uh, but the second thing, I don't know if any educators are listening to us, but one of the things that comes up in my research again and again is that there's a gulf in what schools say about technology between yay we are going to teach you how to code and we are going to talk about one big danger of you don't know who you're talking to online but there's so much more to talk about in terms of risks and in terms of big data and algorithms and datafication that isn't getting talked about as part of those leaflets that are sent home about technology and I think schools and educators possibly need to think about how they speak about technology and to diversify and expand that offering beyond let's learn how to code and stranger danger because there's other things that's not getting talked about.
Thank you so much. It's been really, really um, amazing. Um, I mean, if I could add one final thing, it would be that, you know, we know that our legislators, we don't want our legislators necessarily writing their own algorithms or, or you know, certainly the, their use in some things like policing and education have been controversial. But one thing that is uncontroversial is that we have the right to know about the algorithms that are shaping our lives and our kids' lives. And transparency, real transparency of those algorithms and meaningful accountability to well-informed lawmakers in the US in particular is crucial if we're going to have a culture of safety by design, if we're going to have a culture of safe algorithms that enhance our society, help our children, make our society better rather than you know, the, the way that they operate today. And the only way we're going to get that is if they get off their bums and stop fighting each other literally in Congress and start talking and legislating for parents and for our society. But thank you so much, all of you. It's been such a pleasure to meet you all. And I'm handing back over to Chris. Thank you to all of our panelists and for this in-depth and informative dialogue today. Thank you also to our audience for tuning in and submitting your questions. This was a lively conversation. To learn more about the Institute and all things digital media and child development, please visit our website, childreninscreens.org, follow us on these platforms, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you will join us again for the next Ask the Experts webinar on Wednesday, December 6th, as we take a look at generative AI technologies with AI and children, risks and opportunities of the enhanced internet. Thank you.